Thank you, Acting Speaker. I rise today to speak on the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Amendment Bill 2020. And can I, can I start off uh, my contribution to say that I'm so proud to be part of a progressive Andrews Labor government that has made the conscious and right decision to treat drug policy as a health policy. I can understand how many people for so long have thought that the solution to drug harm was simple, lock them up and throw away the key. But for many of us frontline workers that had to deal with the effects of drugs and alcohol in our jobs, our experience showed us that our society was losing that battle by treating drugs as a law and order issue. The reasons why many in society turn to drug and alcohol abuse is complex and varied. It was clear as a paramedic that the threat of incarceration had zero impact on the decisions of many patients that we came across daily. The influence of drugs did not allow them to even contemplate incarceration. The argument that we should simply be tougher in our approach to drug and alcohol abuse often neglects the reality that real people with complex issues are behind the, the uh, stats. Treating their complex issues is most definitely a health issue. The war on drugs and the fear of the 1980s has often had a reverse effect on the amount of drug users and harm as a result of drugs. Treating this as a health response is not just the humane decision, but is also a smart economic decision. The progressive reforms of this government have seen better access for drug users to medical treatment and reducing the cost in the health system further down the line but also has increased access to support service, services to help actually address the core reasons why an individual is in the situation to begin with. The health response to drugs and alcohol harm is both humane and fiscally responsible. And I think that our society understands that the approach of the past hasn't been successful and better responses that actually begin to address the complexities and deliver results is needed. This has been supported by the 2018 Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry into Drug Law Reform and is consistent with coronial recommendations. And during my time as a paramedic, I came across multiple occasions dealing with people who had overdosed. The time to respond to these call-outs was always critical. The impact on those around someone overdosing is traumatic for the parents, for the partners, for the children, for the friends, for the bystanders. They are often the ones who are making the call and waiting for a medical response to their loved one. Emotions are always high. Regularly I responded to someone that had a drug overdose and was unconscious, non-breathing, pulseless, with bystanders just waiting for the ambulance to arrive. During the 1980s, MICA paramedics were only able to administer naloxone. All we could do was manage the overdose patient's breathing and, uh, breathing and circulation until either MICA arrived or you transported the patient to hospital to have the naloxone administered. I'm pleased to say that since around 1993, all Victorian ambulance paramedics have been able to administer naloxone or Narcan. Because of this, thousands of Victorian lives have been saved. I don't know if anyone in this house has witnessed the administration to an unconscious overdose person once naloxone is administered, the person regains their breathing, they become conscious, and quite often they come up in an aggressive state. They may even try to throw some punches at you, and in many cases they refuse to go to hospital and wander off. And that can happen um, through the course of a shift for a paramedic on more than one occasion. And it can happen to the same person that's overdosed on more than one occasion during the course of a shift. So paramedics could respond to that same person multiple times during the course of the day because they may have overdosed more than once. Naloxone is one of the most effective tools that we can use in keeping people alive during an overdose. The sooner it can be administered, the better the chances are of survival. Nearly one in five deaths in Australia is drug related, with prescri prescription painkillers such as oxycodone, morphine and fentanyl accounting for a significant number of these deaths. This death toll exceeds the number of people killed in road accidents, accidents and every single life lost to drugs is a terrible tragedy. For the families and friends affected and for the wider community. Naloxone is proven to save lives that in many cases would sadly otherwise be lost. It reverses the effects of overdose for opioid drugs like heroin, morphine and fentanyl. It can be easily administered by nasal spray. It does not affect someone who has not used opioids and has no potential for misuse. This bill recognises naloxone's 
efficacy and safety and will epitomise the role of peers in ensuring it gets to those people who are the most in need but the least able to engage with frontline services. And what we mean by peers are the relatives, the friends, the bystanders. This government is proud to be supporting access to naloxone through the naloxone subsidy initiative which enables people to obtain this essential medicine at no cost through 19 needle and syringe program locations. The users or their friends can access it. The initiative is designed to get naloxone in the hands of people who are most at risk of or likely to witness an overdose. Between November 2017 and June 2020, over 11,000 people were trained in the use of naloxone under the initiative and almost 8,000 units were supplied. In this same period, there were over 1,600 instances of reported uses of naloxone by needle and syringe program clients or their networks. That could mean 1,600 lives have been saved. Streamlining the dispensing process will ensure that more Victorians have access to this life-saving treatment and can participate in harm reduction initiatives through the organisations that they know and trust. These initiatives will help support our frontline health workers, especially paramedics. Greater access to naloxone will improve health outcomes and relieve pressure on ambulance response times. And I know paramedics are supportive of greater access to naloxone. Rather than have someone unconscious and non-breathing before they get there, um, if naloxone has been administered, um, hopefully the outcome will be better for that person or that patient. Uh, and um, as I said before, it's quite likely that they become conscious and breathing and wander off after they have that uh, naloxone administered. This government has already seen better management with drug and alcohol issues with our investment of the introduction of real-time prescription monitoring and Victoria's first supervised injecting room in North Richmond. I've talked to many paramedics who tell me about the difference the facility has made since the facility has opened and the hope that an additional site in Melbourne will have. There has been a reduction in ambulance responses to unconscious or dead bodies in the street and that's the reality of what the safe injecting room provides. The safe and easy access to clean needle exchanges is an important program that needs continued support. We know that, that it is common practice for people to obtain sterile injecting equipment on behalf of other people. While technically a breach of the Act, it is accepted as highly effective in reducing the spread of blood-borne viruses from the sharing of used needles. The bill will deliver on the government's commitment to remove this barrier to peer, to peer distribution distribution by creating an exception in the Act such that it will not be an offence for a person who has obtained sterile injecting equipment from an authorised organisation to give it to any other person. Studies have shown that since the inception of programs in Australia to facilitate community access to free sterile injecting equipment, tens of thousands of transmissions of HIV, HIV and Hep C have been averted while saving more than $4 in, in healthcare costs for every dollar spent. The Act in its current form undermines the work of needle and syringe programs to reduce harm and directly impedes safe injecting practices. And people who are taking the appropriate steps to keep their peers safe should be able to continue to do so without the risk of facing punishment. Drug users, their loved ones, their peers should not have to dance around the law in order to practice evidence-based harm reduction. Our harm reduction workers and organisations, particularly those that are peer-led and understand firsthand the needs and challenges faced by this community, should be able to provide support, education and assistance without the hurdles and risks involved in breaching the Act in its current form. We are well aware to, 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 to more than doubling the number of residential rehabilitation beds in Victoria from the 208 beds when we inherited that in 2014. That's right, 208 beds, compared to 492 now, with more than half of those beds in regional Victoria. I know that the trade union movement in, uh, have um, fought hard to try and get a rehabilitation service, and there is a, a model in Sydney called Foundation House, uh, where they provide 28-day residential rehab services for their members. And I know in Victoria, um, HACSU uh, are, are talking about that with many members uh, out of this house and are seeking to set up a similar model, and I've had discussions with HACSO. Helping address this issue and concerns from multiple angles is important for success in improving the quality of life and reverse the negative impact of drug and alcohol abuse in Victoria. 
I want to thank our nurses, doctors, health professionals, paramedics, police and fireys for protecting Victorians, and I commend this bill to the House.